Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over your lab sketchbook. So uh, in case you don't know what you're looking at, it's going to be you know, a piece of paper. You're going to have a big box for you to make a drawing of what that piece of lab equipment looks like. It's going to ask you for its name and then what its purpose is. Okay, so in future, whenever we're doing labs, you'll be able to identify these pieces of lab equipment and you won't have to ask me where the beakers are at or where the pipettes are or what those things are because you'll have a sketchbook that lets you know, okay, here's what the pieces of lab equipment we're going to see all year are. So the first one are the most familiar ones, beakers. So a beaker is just a normally glass, it could be plastic, but it's a glass container in our class. We don't have any plastic ones that's used to hold chemicals. Um, Specifically, you can do that when you are uh, mixing them, when you're heating them, and also obviously when you're storing them. Um, so beakers, just be aware they're different sizes. If you are using a large amount of something or a small amount of something, you wanna make sure you choose a beaker that is appropriate. Um, you don't wanna have a beaker that's too small or too big because that can throw off a whole bunch of stuff when we're doing different labs. Next up, an Erlenmeyer flask, one that you probably didn't know the name of. Uh, Erlenmeyer flasks look kind of like beakers, but then they have a neck to them, and then there's a very narrow opening um, where you can pour things into. So why is there a flask with that shape? Um, specifically, it's used also to hold chemicals, but um, I always say that it's because if a chemical is going to splash and maybe cause an injury, um, then you should probably use an Erlenmeyer flask to do that. Because beakers, you can stir them, and this because they're all symmetrical, um, you're going to end up with like splashing happening on the sides. Uh, whereas in an Erlenmeyer flask, all that splashing is kind of toned down because it's like a cone shape. And so when you're mixing or swirling them, specifically swirling is really nice in an Erlenmeyer flask, uh, you don't have to worry about chemicals splashing out. And so that's why we like to use them. Um, I like to use them whenever we're making solutions of base or acid because acid and base are probably not the best things to get on you. And so Erlenmeyer flasks, if you're mixing them or swirling them around, it lets you have a little bit more freedom to do that. Volumetric flasks aren't really going to be used very much in here. They're not really going to be used until the second semester, but what their purpose is, is they're used to hold on to chemicals just like the previous two, but they're used to measure out only a single accurate amount of liquid. So beakers should never be used to measure things, okay? Um, and technically, Erlenmeyer flasks also should never be used to measure anything. Um, the fact that they have little lines that let you know about how much there is, is just there out of convenience, okay? You don't use them to actually measure things. Volumetric flasks can be used to measure things. Um, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, that picture says 250 ml, and so that's telling you that that flask holds exactly 250 milliliters. So there is a line on the neck of that flask, and if you hit that line, exactly, then that is exactly 250 milliliters. So you can see why it's useful, but um, why it's not very commonly used, right? How often are you going to need exactly 250 milliliters of a solution? Probably not very much. Um, sometimes you need 100 or sometimes you need 150. Volumetric flasks that are calibrated to one number can't give you any in-betweens. They're literally so accurate, they're only meant to be used to measure one quantity of something, and that is it. Next up, funnels. Funnels, whenever we do separations, are going to be used, or when you're, you know, you're trying to get a solid and a liquid mixture, a heterogeneous mixture, kind of separated. Um, you can pour solids uh, through a funnel with a filter on it, and it will catch all of those little pieces of solid, and the liquid will drip out of the other end. So. You can picture putting a piece of paper or a, a coffee filter or something in that funnel, and then if you poured a solution through it that has little solids in it, the solids would get stuck to the filter, and then it would go, all the liquid would go through the funnel. And so that's what funnels are normally used for in lab. Crucibles. So crucibles are these ceramic little dishes that are used to hold materials, but they're, they're ones that are going to be heated up to ridiculously high temperatures. So glass... Um, has its you know uses and everything, but ceramic can be heated up to even higher temperatures. So anytime you're going to be heating something up directly underneath a Bunsen burner with lots and lots of heat, you're probably going to be using a crucible to hold on to whatever you're going to be heating up because crucibles can withstand a huge amount of heat, whereas glass has a little bit less of a use in certain high temperature situations. 
Graduated cylinders. All right, so a graduated cylinder, you are familiar with them. These are used to measure liquids, okay? You don't use beakers to measure liquids. You don't use Erlenmeyer flasks to measure liquids. You use graduated cylinders. And small graduated cylinders are normally used to measure out small quantities of things. And then obviously larger ones are used to measure out larger quantities of things. The only thing is your own, your graduated cylinder is only as good as the measurement you make with it. So you got to be careful whenever you're making measurements with graduated cylinders. Um, you want to make sure you, you're looking at the lines and that you know what each line is. Sometimes it's not one milliliter every line. Sometimes it's two or, you know, sometimes it's some other thing that you're going to have to be aware of. Iron rings. We've used iron rings probably already. Iron rings are used to hold on to equipment. Specifically, we use them to hold on to equipment that's going to be heated. So iron rings can be used to hold on to crucibles. You just put a little piece of mesh down and then the crucible can like, you know, sit on it and get um, heated up. Iron rings resist heating pretty well. So um, they are used for those types of situations when holding on to something would probably not be the best idea. Ring stands. Ring stands are pretty generic. They're used to support devices. Um, we may have already used it to hold on to something other than, you know, an iron ring, but um, iron rings are probably the most common thing you attach to a ring stand. But just be aware that ring stands are used to support many different devices. You can use them to hold on to pH probes. You can use them to hold on to uh, thermometers. A whole bunch of other things can be attached to ring stands. Test tubes. Test tubes are used to hold tiny little samples of things. And again, they are not used to measure things. Notice that in neither of the pictures on the screen right now, you see little lines, right? There are no little lines, which means that those test tubes cannot tell you how much there is inside of it. Um, sometimes you'll see a number on a test tube that'll let you know like, oh, this holds 10 milliliters. But that doesn't mean like there's a line that lets you know where the 10 milliliter mark is. That's why we just use test tubes kind of generically to hold on to small samples of things. And we don't use them to measure things because that would not be useful for us. And even if it did say 10 milliliters on it, technically that's probably the very top of the test tube. So you would not want to use that to measure something accurately, okay? Test tubes are just used to hold on to samples, and that's about it. Test tube racks are used to hold multiple test tubes. Um, test tubes are cylindrical, and so they roll around like crazy, and they're very, very easily broken. And since they're made out of glass, you definitely don't want to mess with test tubes because they will just shatter if you leave them unattended and you let them just roll around on your desk. So that's why we use test tube racks. Anytime we have more than a single test tube, a test tube rack's probably going to be the way to go because you're not going to want to hold on to a bunch of test tubes and keep track of them. Instead, put them in a test tube rack so that you can keep your stuff organized and you know what they're used for. Scoopulas, that is a weird word, all right, but it's kind of a fun word. A scoopula is a little metallic scoop that kind of looks like a shovel, and it's used to scoop out small quantities of solid. So on the back counter, whenever we have like salts and little plastic containers of things, you normally have a scoopula in there that you're using to scoop out solid and put somewhere. So you can, you know, you can add them to a beaker, you can scoop things onto a, a balance, you can scoop things into, uh, you know, a test tube or whatever it might be. But scoopulas are used literally, what their name is, just to scoop small quantities of things out um, and sometimes to measure things if you're trying to you know, get a very accurate reading on a scale. You can scoop some solid on, scoop some solid off until you get the number you want. The last one, pipette. And so pipettes, there are two ways of spelling it. This is just the way I like to spell it. And so um, pipettes are used to dispense tiny little quantities of liquid. They are not used to measure things either. So, so far, the only devices that we've listed that are used to measure things are graduated cylinders, Ding, ding, ding. We use that one all the time. And volumetric flasks, which, by the way, you won't be seeing a whole lot of until the second semester. So don't try to use a pipette to measure how much liquid there is in something. It's not very accurate. And so sometimes there'll even be lines that'll let you think that, oh, maybe I can use this pipette to you know, make a, a pretty decent measurement. You can't. Always use graduated cylinders to make measurements. Pipettes are just convenient to take liquid from one area and put it in a different area, okay? And so that's basically it. So if you needed to pause along the way and write down your stuff and draw your stuff, feel free to go back and do that. But about half of your grade will be based on the Edpuzzle questions that you answer, and the other part will be based on your lab sketchbook that you're going to be showing me filled in and completed tomorrow.
All right. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know.